Everyone hear me? Yes. Cool. All right. Just making sure I'm not talking to the void. So um, this is a bit of a proto talk and a bit of an experience report of stuff that we've been working on lately. Um, I submitted a proposal uh, for the CFP that just closed for Codebeam in Mountain View, California, in November. So probably going to, you know, this is sort of a trial run of some of the ideas I'm going to present in that talk. So you get a little sneaky preview. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about where we're at in the current state of the web. So over the last, I guess, five to 10 years, we've seen the rise of the single page app or the, the SPA. And honestly, we've been working with that for sort of five plus years and it's been a pretty good choice. We've sort of settled on pretty early on uh, in our sort of company um, life. The React on the front, um, GraphQL in the middle is a pretty good API. Um, layer, you know, served up by Phoenix, which is a great web framework, as I'm sure most of you would know, uh, with Postgres storing the data on the back. Works pretty great. Um, you know, builds upon the stuff that Rails was doing, keeps it simple. Um, and I think one of the key things that we wanted to try and do was we saw when we sort of started Alembic, saw the, the rise of the real-time UI, um, and we saw that sort of being enabled in sort of two ways. One, by the fact that Elixir works on the beam and that we could scale, you know, not very much compute or very many nodes to quite a lot of traffic. And, you know, Erlang's been doing that for quite a long time. And if anyone remembers the early Phoenix, 2 million WebSocket connections uh, with PubSub and lots of stuff happening, that was pretty exciting. Um, so we saw on one angle, the ecosystem supporting large scale, but also GraphQL subscriptions, um, which were pretty early days, sort of five, six years ago, um, really allowing instead of a pool based request response architecture, like sort of old HTTP, we were seeing that that allowed to have sort of push type architectures. Um, and that sort of happened, but it hasn't really taken off quite like we expected. Um, so it's sort of interesting to note that we still haven't seen the race of everyone doing sort of live UIs, but I think they're coming in. Um, so that stack's worked pretty well um, for a lot of people. It's been pretty productive. Um, but I think what we've seen with the rise of live view is that we can probably do better. There are some complexities here. So, you know, at a top level, there's two languages, a JavaScript side or a TypeScript side. We've tended to be doing TypeScript um, since that's become pretty popular a few years ago. Um, you tend to have a split brain of sort of two repos with two different deployment life cycles. Um, you lose some of the simplicity of you know, one repo, one deployment. Um, you know, there's some benefits to that because you can split front end teams and back end teams, but often, you know, that's a bit overkill if you've got very small teams. The other thing is sort of three potentially different type systems that you have to synchronize across the entire stack. Um, and there's, you know, with all of that, a fair bit of complexity that can go away. But the key thing here is that the sort of the feedback loop is much slower. So that, that's quite important. Um, and we've got more layers than we need. So, you know, do we, we had Phoenix and that was just server side rendered one repo, sprinkles of JavaScript and HTML. Um, but now we have two more layers and a bit more complexity. But I think a lot of you who've been around since the Rails days sort of probably remember and the early Phoenix server side render days was that we had really fast feedback loops. You could think a thing, type a thing, see a thing on screen within a matter of seconds. And that was very, very productive. And I think with the rise of the SPA and the JavaScript front end and the API in the middle, we've forgotten really how fast and productive uh, that was. And I think YView brings back some of the joy of really tight, super fast 
you know, sub-second feedback loops. So yeah, Live View sort of came out in sort of 2019, uh, thereabouts. So it's been around for a few years now. It challenges are traditional sort of, well, now traditional SPA architecture. Um, and it massively simplifies those architectural layers, gets rid of the, the sort of separate front end, gets rid of the API layer as well, which often actually just served the web app that we were dealing with. And we often tended not to have the mobile app or a separate client. So it was really an API searching for another client to serve rather than just the front end that you were building alongside of it. Um, and I think Live View really sort of boils that JavaScript down to the absolute bare minimum. Um, you know, where we'll see some apps a bit later on, but I think we're sort of in the order, even for some complex drag and drop stuff, only sort of sub thousand line lines of JavaScript. And I think that could be potentially even smaller. And that's, you know, sometimes you need to bust out to do drag and drop and, and so forth. Um, and some things in the client. Um, but by default, we're sort of storing most of our state on the server, which is where it should be. So yeah, JavaScript sprinkles, um, a little bit of transient UI state, but largely we're sending everything back to the server so that the application knows what's happening. And that works pretty well. And so basically Live View has restored that ultra fast feedback loop that we lost in the SPA. Um, but Live View hasn't been really ready since the beginning. So it was pretty new back in 2019. WebSockets was a bit of a scary way to build a web application when you were used to you know, the sim simplicity of a request response HTTP one cycle. Um, and it didn't really have a component ecosystem. And you could argue that, you know, that's still in progress. Um, and we've been using it on various projects for admin UIs, but for sort of end user facing UIs, we really haven't been quite ready to, to pull the trigger on that. And so we've been doing that typical React GraphQL front end. So yeah, we didn't have function components until very recently. So that simple component model for really stateless, just pure functional presentational components was actually missing. Um, but what's the state of live view these days? It's a little bit different three years on. So, you know, probably a bold statement, but I think it's a much more mature framework now and we've smoothed off a lot of the rough edges. Um, we've got, with the introduction of function components, a pretty solid component model. And one of our devs, who's a bit more of a React front-ender, felt really comfortable and really familiar just looking at how Live View hangs together as it currently stands. I think, yeah, we'll put that down to, there's a pretty clear sort of mapping of Live View managing sort of parent state, reusable stateful components in the middle with Live Component and simple stateless, pure functional function components, which really are quite pleasant. Um, so yeah, it feels like React. This is sort of what our React front-end architecture roughly looks like. There's a lot of things going on. We've sort of got React, we've got TypeScript, we've got GraphQL. Um, we've been experimenting with sort of React uh, type generator, what was it, GraphQL type generator, which gives you a way of taking a GraphQL schema and generating types so you don't have to manually create those for your React app. Um, We've been using various kind of, you know, React app or what have you. We've been doing a lot of Next lately, but there's a lot of layers here. You know, you've got to have a client for your GraphQL. You've got to build GraphQL queries. You've got to build the schema. Um, we've been getting a lot of mileage out of Tailwind. Um, and this is the sort of story for testing, Cypress Jest for unit testing, story for you know, having a way to catalog all of your components and, you know, share those with the team. Uh, over in Live View land, and although this isn't really a sort of one-to-one -one mapping, it sort of, it feels pretty familiar because it's layered roughly the same way. 
So at the live view level, we're looking at sort of routing, we're looking at auth, we're looking at doing the data fetching. Live components are our reusable stateful components with events. Um, typically, it's a good idea that they shouldn't contain any styling. Um, and that sort of follows the idea that we keep that headless, like Tailwind's headless UI, where you have fully functional components, where you add your own styles on using the functional, uh, the function components, the presentation or UI components. So that's where we do our Tailwind stuff. Um, you'll do Storybook and Surface Catalog sort of takes the place of uh, Storybook there. There isn't one for Live View yet, but I think that's probably inevitable. Um, and we sort of separate the layout components so we can compose our apps together nicely. But I think the main point here is that it's a pretty familiar component model now, and it wasn't always that way because we were missing the function component part. Um, so I've mentioned Surface. Uh, its innovations have driven some of the latest stuff that's been happening in my view. Um, so I have some regrets for not looking at Surface UI. I'm pretty sure it's been on my to-do list for probably two years, um, but I never got around to it. And I really regret that now that I have. So it's sort of driven the innovation and experimentation around function components, um, prop typing, prop docs, um, named slots, which have all recently landed in live view itself. Um, <clears throat> and I think the killer feature for me is the auto generated component catalog. So you can use all of that information that is declared in your component uh, files and your modules and generate a component catalog, much like Storybook, um, but it's even more sort of introspective also it sort of generates most of that for you. Um, it's used on extremely large sites. So I've heard some, you know, what's the, what's the word? I, I guess experience reports from someone who worked on the cars.com site. And I think, I don't know exactly what their traffic is, but you know, it's in the order of hundreds of thousands of concurrent users. And they basically used it on their homepage to do effectively a, you know, autocomplete search. Um, they ran into a couple of issues, but it largely worked out really well for them despite these issues. They had a bit of RAM bloat because of how they modeled, you know, all of the state on the server side, which they probably shouldn't have. Um, and they had some issues training the web sockets when they redeployed because there was, you know, tens of thousands of people connected to the front page. Um, so they probably could have sidestepped some of those things, but, you know, I think having people do this kind of stuff at this kind of scale has actually helped live UB a lot better. So I think with all that said, live view is definitely ready for prime time where it probably hasn't been um, quite so ready until now. So uh, I don't know if everyone's heard of the pedal stack. Um, Matt certainly has because he's runs a site called pedal build and is building out various bits of that. Um, but Petal stands for Phoenix, Elixir, Tailwind, Alpine, and Live. Um, so a great little stack. Um, but we've been sort of riffing on taking that a little bit further and modifying it a touch and adding Surface and replacing the Alpine with Ash. And we've been, you know, going pretty well with that. So Surface, for those who haven't played around with it yet, definitely recommend checking it out. So it's got a different but compiled um, template language. So it is a bit different. There's lots of conveniences in there. Um, they probably don't sort of stand out when you read the docs by themselves, but I think they, they add up in practice to be really quite handy. Um, and they certainly have things that Heaps does not have. Um, one of the restrictions is that you have to have a component per module. Um, whereas function components, we can drop lots of different function components inside one module. With, re, uh, with Surface, you need to have one per module. I don't think that's a massive restriction, but you know, it is kind of nice if you've got really, really small function components to, to do one, well, many per, per module. Um, as I said before, they've got the declarative prop, props with docs um, and these are all introspectable to sort of generate stuff like the component catalog, which we'll see in a second. Um, it has event management. 
Uh, you've got slots, which are just placeholders for custom content. I think Surface did that first and then they got brought into to Live View fairly recently. Um, it's also compiled, so it's doing validations for your templates, making sure that the HTML is correct, your components are modeled correctly, and that all the props, events, and slots are set up right and used correctly. And there's reasonable editor integration as well. Um, the catalog for me is probably the killer feature that LiveView did, definitely does not have um, because it's collecting some of the other features. But having a storybook, um, that introspects your components and puts it into a you know a mountable in your app doc or component catalog and doc page is pretty compelling. And so you know building components in isolation, designing them, making sure they're correct before composing them into your application is a very powerful idea. So it's not full storybook and it's still sort of on the tin experimental, but definitely is pretty compelling and already is is quite good and we're uh, enjoying using that. Uh, so let's have a quick look at Surface. Uh, do I, let's get the browser over. It's gonna show you what the component catalog looks like. Um, this was one thing that I was struggling to remember Today, there's little conveniences like this where you can sort of go, here's a string of classes, we're gonna have modal, and then you can have a keyword list with you know, the string and the Boolean that represents whether that's gonna be on or off or not. And you can see here are the props and the validations, whether things are required or not. Uh, you've got defaults uh, for data management, and that's sort of for stateful components. And you've got sort of slots for passing in you know, subsections of your component to customize bits of it. Sorry to cut you off, Josh. Uh, could you increase the zoom level on your um, browser? Can do. Thank you. So uh, that was just something I was looking at. The docs are pretty good, worth checking this out. There's some interesting things around how events are managed that are quite different. Um, there's just lots of little conveniences kicking around and I probably don't have time to go into that. What I really want to show you is A, there's some built-in components in Surface, and this is sort of self-hosting the catalog. So you can have your usable components and you know examples of how to use it. And then all of your docs generated from what we just saw from a component definition, props, slots, and events, all managed there. And look, that's that's pretty nice. Um, so you can build out uh, various examples and variations of different components in different states. Um, but look, there's some examples here to sort of read from. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely go have a look. Um, it's sort of like living in live view sort of future world. Um, so I won't go into too much more detail there, um, but definitely have a look. So what else? I mean, I'm going to assume that most people have heard of Tailwind by this point. Um, I'll give you a quick overview. If you haven't heard of it, you've clearly been living under a rock or in a cave on a mountain somewhere. But it's utility styles in normal HTML classes. Um, I think it largely solves CSS problems for applications. Um, but what it represents is a very thin, but you know, you can easily see through what the abstraction is, it's not complicated. It's sort of a, usually a mapping of one class to one CSS rule. Um, and you've got the ability to theme stuff um, sort of orthogonally to how you style things. Um, so good for building design systems. It is beneficially just plain old HTML and CSS. So there's no sort of JavaScript, CSS and JS requirement. It's just plain old, um, you know, class styles and that's it on a nice reset where you don't have to unpick anything. So a lot of people think it's like bootstrap and it really, it might look like that, but it really, there's nothing to unpick. Um, it's just plain old styling with classes. And I find it quite a good abstraction because it helps me reason about CSS at just a slightly higher level without sort of getting in the way of what CSS does. Um, and the docs are really, really quite good. So 
a lot of people pick it up and start playing with it and start getting you know big long class strings with lots of styling in there and go well there's lots of duplication happening here you will see that you'll probably feel like this is a bit ugly the key thing to sort of think about is that the way to remove duplication is to abstract through components and so in doing so we've kind of killed the cascade which is useful for documents but it's really good for applications um yeah sorry the cascade is not very useful for applications so removing it is a good idea and in removing the cascade and the spooky action at a distance we've essentially solved css for applications so if you've struggled as a sort of back-end developer to make things look good tailwind can help uh one of the killer features of tailwind is tailwind ui and that is a um, paid for thing but it's very good value um and it is effectively a good starter kit for a component library and you can copy and paste the html and just modify it to what you need so you know when you want a component go hunting through the tailwind ui catalog and literally just copy and paste the html out and modify it to what you need and the key thing about tailwind is you can copy and paste the css and it just works which is serious magic if you've ever wanted to do that and you couldn't uh that was that's the power of css done in you know utility style uh so alpine this was interesting one of the talks uh i think it was in codebeam i don't remember what the talk was if anyone remembers what it was shout out um but it didn't occur to me that, that alpine was simply a massive security risk waiting to happen so in order to do what it does alpine basically does unsafe evals um and when you actually are strict about it it sort of takes away a lot of the power of what it can do um so it sort of is worth recommending not to use it because of that security risk it's just a bit too dangerous because you know effectively um JavaScript can be injected and run in your sites when you didn't definitely do not want that. Um, but a lot of the modern bit uh, features in Live View sort of meant that you could do a lot of the JavaScript sprinkles, show hide, toggle classes, that kind of stuff, you know, little transient UI state changes. And so you kind of didn't really need Alpine anyway. Um, so we've replaced the A in pedal that did represent Alpine with Ash. Um, I'll talk you through a little bit of the Ash philosophy. Because if you go to the website, Ash doesn't really describe itself particularly well yet. Um, so it's worth talking about it, the philosophy. The key thing is that it's a DSL for declaring a domain model, um, effectively modeling your nouns and your verbs and your relationships. Um, and then once you've done that, it's Effectively, the rest of Ash is a framework for deriving or generating literally everything else about your app from that declarative, um, introspectable core. So that's quite a powerful idea. Um, so keep that in mind when you're sort of taking a look at it. I think some of the benefits are worth calling out. Um, it's easy to switch data layers. So it comes with a bunch of different data layers. Um, Postgres is, is the main one, and you should probably use that. I don't think Amnesia is quite ready for prime time. It sort of serves as an, as an example. Um, but it does test itself with ETS. Um, so all of its internal testing is done with the ETS data layer. Um, and using Postgres, we can generate migrations, because what it does is effectively create a snapshot of your resources, your you know, uh, models and generate migrations for you based on the difference that it finds. Um, you can also, from your resource model, generate admin UIs automatically. We've used it recently to build a super complex nested form directly from our models using the Phoenix uh, Live Form Helper. Um, what else can you do? You can, I think one of its sort of key features, and it seemed to me when I first looked at this, a while back, it was like, oh, generate JSON API or GraphQL APIs. Um, and it seemed like that's all it did, but that's actually just a side effect of once you put it into this 
declarative DSL introspectable form, it, it is easy to create your APIs off the back of that. And that's quite important because if we're losing our React front end and therefore our GraphQL, GraphQL API as well, um, if we ever get a mobile app, which often, you know, doesn't happen, you end up with just a web client. But if you do need a mobile app, you're going to need an API. And so having Ash to be able to put an API that is appropriate um, for whatever you need for other clients other than your web app is quite handy. Other bunch of features like it handles auth policies pretty nicely, it does pub sub notifications and stuff like that. I'll give you a quick tour in a sec. In fact, right now, um, let's close that down. Um, which one is it? So this is the main website, um, but Zach, the author, is sneakily working on this new site, which is a, a whole doc refresh. And it just gives you a sense of what do Ash resources look like. Um, so we declare a module that's our post in this case. We select a Postgres data layer, define what the table and the repo looks like for XO. Um, we can define our attributes, which is a sort of equivalent to our Ecto schema, but it has baked in DSL validations and so forth and typing. Um, the other thing that we model out is our actions. So those are the things that we can do to our app. Um, and there's a way to actually take the actions and automatically create the code that you would otherwise write in a Phoenix context. Uh, we've got our relationships here as well. Um, this is what it looks like to interactively work with that model that's created. So you can do queries and you can do all that kind of stuff. Um, this here is how you build, let everyone read that, build a GraphQL API. I'll see if I can make it bigger. So you can describe from your model over here what the GraphQL API looks like. Um, Authorization policies is something we haven't used, but we're looking to use it. And it's a quite powerful DSL for describing who can access what on your models um, in a data layer independent way. Um, aggregates and calculations are defined like this. Um, and this is sort of simple one that's got a little expression language, but you can also bust out to, you know, custom code that has a pretty nice little API. So any custom logic that you need to build, um, we've built stuff like materialized paths and tree views, for example, and you basically just specify a module that has that code and you can test it like normal. And so what's nice about this is you get a pretty nice structure of a DSL where you know where all the bits are and then anything that you need to do custom, you can call out to through a pretty clear and simple API and test any custom business logic that you need to do um, independently of Ash. Uh, we haven't tried this yet, but it is something that we're looking to try pretty soon. You can get, you know, all your pop sub notifications of, of things that are changing in your models. Um, so that's worth checking out. And there's a bunch of Phoenix Live View helpers as well. So there's a Phoenix form helper that we've used to tame one of the wildest forms I've ever seen. Uh, ask Theo if you want to hear the, the painful tale of that. Theo's nodding, wiping a tear. Um, so yeah, that, that's a quick tour of Ash. Um, it's pretty powerful stuff. I don't think we've really scratched the surface um, of some of the benefits yet, but it's been, it's been pretty good to work with. Um, things to consider when you're taking a look at it. The docs currently, as it stands, aren't really ready, but I just showed you the new site. Zach's working on the new doc refresh. Um, and so docs are certainly going to get a lot better. Um, but there's a lot to document. So I think keeping in mind the core philosophy, that's quite important. What else? There's a large surface area. It can be a bit overwhelming. But yeah, keep that philosophy in mind. It's still nominally in beta. Um, Zach is probably not promising anything, but six to eight weeks is sort of a reasonable timeline where a 2.0, aka a 1.0 release is coming. Um, I'm not sure how it, the numbering got kind of worked out, but it's one point something, but it's not really. 
Um, but look, we're finding that, you know, once you get over the initial humps of learning and just figuring out how it works uh, and where to put things, it's extremely productive and it works pretty well. Um, and we're, you know, we're finding some bugs, but we're fixing them very, very quickly. So I think it will be well beaten up by the time it gets to a 2.0. Um, yeah, I think I've said everything to say there. So what have we been building with it? Um, complex stuff. Probably not going to uh, say too much about this because it's a, a client domain model. But the point is that there's lots of spaghetti going on there and it's, <laughs> it's damn complicated. So, you know, what I might do is just show you very quickly. How are we doing for time, by the way? It's, uh, it's about five to seven, so we've still got plenty of time. Cool. So um, one of the apps we've been building is a not super complicated on the domain model side, but what it is is a scheduling for primary schools application. Um, and I think you can sort of see by some of the stuff that you're seeing is that we've got a Google Calendar in the middle. Um, which we thought was going to be quite challenging to build out. Um, but interestingly enough, it's been, once we sort of got to grips with CSS Grid and how we were going to lay it out, it's been kind of nice. Um, so CSS Grid, if you haven't checked it out, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so we've got, yeah, a quite configurable calendar kind of view with different sort of guidelines and labels. We've got drag and drop happening that are snapping to minute by minute um, timetables. Uh, if you see the red view here, we've got clashes between different activities that are happening. Um, and let me see. So when I'm dragging this, which was something that we weren't sure that Live View and JavaScript were going to work well together on, uh, but it turns out that it's actually been pretty reasonable. So when we start the drag, you can see up on the top of Tuesday that we can't drop those things there. We still allow it to happen, um, but it's just indicating where it's going to cause a clash, which means the red highlight. So I can move it out of the way, presumably down here somewhere. So what else can I show you in here? We've got various filters going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, effectively, Tailwind has been really useful here to sort of tame the CSS grid, which has a lot of rows because it's minute by minute. Um, you probably didn't see it snapping to the, the, the minutes, but yeah, we thought that was going to be super complicated. Um, and we don't have a lot of JavaScript going on here. We've used a library called Interact.js, which is largely doing what we need it to do for this stuff. And we can sort of drag and drop various bits over here. Um, yeah, so it's proved out to be pretty good, but that's a complicated UI, less complicated back end. Um, but we've taken about 12 weeks to sort of build something that I would argue is pretty complex um, and come up with a pretty tractable thing. Uh, the other thing that we've been building is a work design and optimization tool. Uh, which is fairly complex. Let's close this off. Um, what's the best way to describe this? This is a, yeah, if you can imagine the Toyota Lean production system that optimizes work on a regular basis for sort of factory contexts. This is an application that designs work, complex work for use cases you know, like mining, like doing massive truck services, where they do really complex work. Uh, it's potentially quite inefficient if they haven't designed the work. And yeah, essentially they can make massive improvements to, you know, it's done regularly, but not very often. And so it's deeply complex. So making sure that you've captured all the things that the work needs to do um, or the workers need to do when they're, servicing a truck so that, you know, there's health and safety and so forth and all the risks sort of managed. And we've got 
some pretty interesting interactions between the, the work stuff over here and where it's happening on the spatial view over here. Um, so lots of um, things going on there. This is the sort of relatively complex element view. Um, this is the form from hell. It's one form sort of assisted by the ash form the helper um, to give us a pretty complex form and make it pretty reasonable to, to deal with. So there's sort of all of this stuff in here is subforms of a, of a mega form. Um, is there anything that I'm not saying here, Theo? I think down here we've got a fairly complex tree view that we've just built from scratch, and that was actually pretty good. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Got some other tree views that are you know relatively custom happening over here. Um, we've got sort of all sorts of pop-ups and hovers and interesting stuff happening. Uh, we can get multiple operating multiple operations happening side by side. There's a lot of data happening here. Something's going on there. But I think uh, what else have we got going on? No, I'm saying not sure what's happening there. Any idea there? Oh, I'm Get a bug that we... I think we're still getting ready to deploy the optimization changes we've made to staging. Uh, cool. So, yeah, we've spent about 12 weeks building this, give or take, and, yeah, it's ended up pretty far along, given that we've got a, you know, relatively unfamiliar tool chain. We've picked up a, picked up a few new tools in order to evaluate them, um, and it's been still pretty productive despite all that. So back to the presentation. Let's look at what we've learned from all that stuff. So as I said, we built some pretty complex apps very quickly um, for both of them. Yeah, we've sort of gone from scratch to dog fooding with customers or demoing with customers in about 12 weeks. Um, for both projects. Uh, the one that we just saw has a deeply complex domain model, but you know the class scheduling for primary schools isn't exactly trivial, but it's just not quite as spaghetti driven as the other one. Um, I think you'll agree that building Google Calendar surrounded by a pivot table, uh, surrounded by drag and drops is you know fairly complex. Um, but yeah, despite all that, I think we've gone pretty fast, despite we're not really familiar with some of the, the tools that we picked up to use with, and that would be Ash. And yeah, I guess some of the drag and drop libraries, which are core mechanics to both applications, that's been a little bit of a challenge, um, but we've largely survived most of those things. Um, it turned out, and this was a bit of a surprise for me, that we didn't actually need a component ecosystem, like a full blown one. Now this surprised me because it was, you know, kind of a thing that's like, well, should, can we really do apps in, in live view without any components whatsoever? Um, like you might have in a React ecosystem. So like, you know, I'm missing a tree view or I'm missing a sortable filterable data table, for example. Um, but I think it turned out <laughs> that why would you fight someone else's terrible abstraction, which was, generally built for lots of different use cases that aren't yours, um, when you can just build your own pretty easily from scratch. Um, and that was an outcome that really kind of surprised me because, you know, tree views are notionally complex, um, but it was actually relatively easy to, to build the ones that we've built. Um, we built them pretty quickly. We've sort of evolved them over time um, and that's worked pretty well. Um, you can take a look at the video of the last talk I did, which was the sort of sortable, filterable um, data grid. And that wasn't very much code at all. It was sort of 50 to 100 lines of pretty simple components. So that's been useful. Uh, Matt's here. He's responsible for building the pedal components. And 
yeah, we picked that up thinking, oh, here's a bit of a component system um, that's pre-built. Let's, let's take a look at that. And it is pretty great, actually. So if you want to know how live view function components uh, look when you build out a real design system, check that out. Um, it does, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it defaults to Alpine JS, but I think that security issue is something that probably <laughs> would mean that that's not such a good idea. Um, oh, yeah, we've made it so it's optional now. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about the Alpine JS issue? Um, yeah, we're, we're just trying to remove all the, yeah, like get rid of the A <laughs> as well. Maybe we'll move to Ash as well. Good idea. Yeah. I mean, I think Alpine seemed like a good idea um, in the pedal stack, which sort of was sort of coined probably a year, a year ago, two years ago. Um, so it's relatively recent and Alpine seemed like a useful idea, but with the latest changes to live view, it hasn't turned out to be that useful um, because all you really need is those, you know, quite transient UI sprinkles. Um, and Alpine didn't, I mean, I don't know how much you played with it, but it didn't seem to really have the component, the components that you might really want to use in an app. Um, yeah, I haven't used it as much as I thought I would. And yeah. it's, only, it's only really in the dead views, I guess, like the non-live views is when you need it. Yeah, but with live view and the latest sort of JS hooks, you really don't need the Alpine part. So, you know, don't <laughs> risk the security issue and just leave it alone, I think is the upshot from that. Um, the problem with the pedal components that we found, though, was we wanted to change what it looked like and all of the Tailwind classes were baked in. So what we ended up doing was being inspired by the components that we found in the library and then just forking them or just copying and pasting it and modifying the classes ourselves and, you know, twisting it to what we needed it to do. Um, all right. And that worked pretty well. So conclusion, live is ready for user facing apps. Pedal stack's good, um, but stable stack we found is, is better. It's not that much different. We're adding Surface, and I think that's just like living in live view future land. Um, and Ash has proven very, very productive for effectively being, you know, kind of like a generator for your backend, uh, declarative DSL, where you can generate a lot of stuff and get a lot of, you know, standardization around your app. We're building some pretty ambitious stuff and finding all those tools pretty helpful. We've been productive despite a pretty new tool chain. Um, and yeah, definitely check out Surface and check out Ash. And here are some links. Any questions? Yeah, uh, interactions like on your, like, the sidebar coming out and those kind of JavaScripty stuff was that just mainly like hooks and the like liveview.js? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, any modal kind of stuff, I believe so. I can't remember, it's been a while since I've looked at the code. Uh, Theo can probably answer that question better than I can. Yeah, I'm pretty so sure it's all just hooks. Our um, pull out menus and stuff that's all JS hooks, um, and then at least for the work design app, all of the dragging and dropping functionality is using a JavaScript library called Sortable and it's hooking into Phoenix with Phoenix hooks. Yeah. Yep. Oh, cool. I will say one thing that the state of non, or I guess non-framework drag and drop JavaScript libraries, it's a toilet. <laughs> so, uh, plan accordingly. We don't, the, yeah, the Interact's probably the best one that we've found. Um, but yeah, it's just a state of abandoned and unmaintained libraries of various, you know, vintages with all kinds of different problems. So watch out if you're going to do some drag and drop and probably make Interact your first protocol because we use sortable and we had a lot of issues that I think 
you guys solved today, right? Yeah. Yes, we did. It was a relatively simple fix, but it's a bug. And the framework maintainers for a lot of these frameworks that we've checked out aren't super active. So you do have to be careful. Yeah, probably the most annoying one was, I think it was Shopify. It was amazing thing, you know, it had an amazing site, had a pretty great um, draggable uh, library and then abandoned it at 1.0 beta 12 or something. <laughs> and then just went, nah, we can't bother to maintain this. It's all yours. Um, which is kind of sad because, you know, it looks good and then you look at it and you go, yeah, how maintained is this? Unclear. Yeah. I had a question around um, Surface. Mm -hmm. How well does it interop with uh, Hicks and, like, the function components that you might, say, grab out of pedal components? Can you just interop between them pretty easily? I believe so, but I believe there are restrictions and I can't remember what they are. So, yeah, I did very hastily put this talk together. So it's a good question. Um, they're not, the two languages aren't completely compatible and Surface has a bunch of, if anyone's as old as me and remembers like the old JavaScript, the, the old Java, not JavaScript, um, template libraries like FreeMarker and velocity and that kind of stuff where they had their own little language um, because they didn't want you to do any, you know, too incomplete coding within your template language. Uh, the templating language, and I don't even know what it's called, it's the F sigil for surface. Um, it takes conveniences and in that kind of style. So they're really not compatible, but I think you know, because we're sort of having to pick, well, is it Surface that we're going to go with or is it Live View, which is, you know, what's the future going to look like? We don't know, but I'm, I think my suspicion is that let's just live in the future world of Surface and if we ever have to backport, it shouldn't be too much of a, of a hassle. And, yeah, there is an interop set of constraints and I don't remember what they are. Does anyone else remember what they are? I think you can call one from the other without any problems. I mean, it should be interoperable, but I don't know if it's completely 100%. I think there are some constraints. Josh, I had a uh, question about Ash. Um, uh, could be less than six months ago, mm, probably less than much less than six months ago. It seemed like Ash was uh, something that you would expend quite a lot of innovation tokens on, bring it into a, uh, a project. And that's just, that's just my impression. Uh, but um, what uh, uh, what's kind of changed there, do you think? Or um, is it just, uh, is it just a, a matter of marketing? But my impression was such that it would be maybe you know, yeah, a bit too much to do as well as living in future, future live view land and. Um, you know. Yeah, look, I mean, I would approach it cautiously. Um, we just happen to have those two projects be in a state where A, we're starting from scratch. Um, you know, we had the opportunity to go and use, you know, this stack and try a few things out because we were, trying to sort of do something relatively quickly to get it in front of customers to test product market fit and to see where the customers would buy this thing. So it didn't have to be, you know, super production ready out of the gate. Um, but it's turned out that, you know, it's pretty robust. Um, but yeah, we have run into some issues, but we've been furiously, you know, Zach, we did actually hire Zach to support us because that was, the only way to go as fast as we did. So he's been sort of spending, you know, an hour a week, a bit of extra time sort of helping, helping us resolve issues and, and fix them pretty quickly. And he's been very responsive otherwise, um, even before we sort of engaged a support contract. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's been super helpful. And we've found, you know, just a lot of rough edges that we've smoothed out, we've figured out bugs and, you know, just gone and fixed them. 
Um, so even despite doing all of that, we've still been pretty quick in the scheme of things. When we zoom out, and it might have felt hard at the time, but we've gone pretty quickly, given you know the complexity of what we're building and how long it's taken. So I have another question about Ash. Uh, you mentioned being able to kind of pick and choose the database that you're using. Is there a timeline and or difficulty estimate for something like SQLite as a database option? Um, so the thing to go look at is Ash Postgres. So that is the, the Ash module and it is separate to Ash um, that represents the Postgres data layer. And I think you know, if you can take all of the Postgres specific pieces and turn those into SQLite specific pieces, um, I don't know how long that would take, but you know, it should be pretty mechanical. And you know, I will say for for the work design application, the deployment plan for that is to be you know one client because they're big sort of mining companies. It's one client <laughs> per deployment, and it'll be on premise, and they're probably going to have SQL Server. So we're, de we're developing it with Postgres because that's what's there. But it may be that in future, once we sort of hand this over to customers, that we would have a SQL Server data layer. So all that's required to, to get that, and different customers might have different database requirements, um, is to essentially port Ash Postgres into you know, all the SQL Server specific SQL. Which, look, I mean, I mean having worked on an app that had to support both MySQL and SQLite and Postgres, it's pain. But if you only have to do it in one layer that's general, then that's pretty tractable. And you've, you've got the template there. You just have to change the SQL and make sure it works. Thank you. I will say that, yeah, I, I did initially try to use the Amnesia plugin, and I don't think that's quite ready. So do do either use Ants or or Postgres. Probably just go straight for Postgres. We've you know not really had any issues with that. Gener generating migrations automatically is really quite pleasant because it usually takes a while to you know write a up and a down migration, and just having a button to reflect the diff for the database is pretty handy. Cool. If there's no more questions, thanks everyone.